My name is Valerie Skelly. I'm 73 years old. Today is Thursday, August 8th, 2013. I'm at the Belmore Memorial Library. The person I'm interviewing is my spouse. My name is John E. Skelly, normally called Jack. My age is 77. The date is Thursday, August 8th, 2013. I'm at the Belmore Memorial Library and my relationship is I'm her husband. Let's start at the beginning, Jack. Uh, how long have you lived in Belmore? I've lived in Belmore for 74 years. And uh, where did you live before that? Uh, we lived in Hicksville. And what made your, made your family move or your parents move to Belmore? Um, they never really told me. It's, uh, I imagine it was during the Depression and they were looking for an affordable house or a place to live. And Belmore happened to be it. Um, do you remember where you first lived, your first, uh, your first house or a place where you lived in Belmore? Yes, the first place we lived in Belmore was an apartment on Belmore Avenue, on the corner of Belmore Avenue and uh, Beltog. And it was an upstairs apartment. It was two stores downstairs. And we lived there for approximately a year and a half. Then my parents rented a house on Lafayette Street in North Belmore. And then the owner of the house told my parents that he was selling the house. They could buy it if they wanted it, but they really didn't want it. And in the meantime, my father got a regular job in working for Grumman Aviation. And they put enough money together to buy the house where I grew up, which was on Wallace Avenue in North Belmont. Okay. Um, as far as Belmore, uh, growing up here, can you tell me, uh, since you lived here your whole life, how things have changed or what you miss most about the old Belmore? Well, my growing up years, Belmore was um, mostly semi-rural, I guess would be the best way to put it. Um, where we lived in North Belmore, oh, at least 70% of the, the land was vacant. It was woods and just open land. It was houses. We didn't have rows of houses. It was a house, then it was lots and another house maybe, that type of thing. Um, it was um, it was nicer in, in a sense that it was, uh, you knew everybody. Um, what about um, farmland or orchards? I know you had mentioned that to me. Now that was a little further north Belmore, right? Yes, that was north on North Jerusalem Road. There was a commercial peach farm that was around oh, 150 acres and somewhere in that range. And uh, of course, being seven or eight, we'd ride up on a bike at night and uh, peaches picked <laughs> off the tree were really good. <laughs> uh, you had a friend uh, who had, uh, whose family owned a farm, is that right? Yes. Um, north of Jerusalem Avenue was quite rural at the time when I was in grammar school. And I went to school with a boy, Joseph, and his mother and father had a farm on Columbus Avenue in North Belmore. And it was a regular farm. They had cows and chickens and pigs, and they grew crops and that type of thing. And... Uh, on Saturday morning, he had chores, and in order to play, I used to go up on my bike around 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, and we did his chores, and which involved more or less cleaning up the barn and yards and stuff, 
and by 10, 10.30 or so, his chores would be done. His mother would give us something to eat, and then we had the rest of the day to play. And what did you do when you played? What, what, what were some of the things you did? Oh, um, we used to play in the barn. It was nice. We used to chase the chickens. <laughs> um, we would uh, we would just go out in the woods, look around. Um, uh, lots of lots of areas where, uh, since we didn't have um, the sanitation pickup system that we have today, people would just take an area in a, in a woods, and it would became a local dump. And uh, being eight years old, you always figured you could find something valuable there. Um, when you, you said you went to school with Joseph, what school did you uh, okay. attend? Um, we went to St. Barnabas, which is now um, some other Seton? Or no. Yeah, Elizabeth Seton Liz now, Elizabeth yes. Elizabeth Seton, yeah. But it was, um, it was St. Barnabas. It was from first to eighth grade, and the school was there, and the church, and... Um, did you walk? Because I know you said yes, you lived on Wallace yes. Avenue in North Belmont. Yes, we walked. Um, I started school in 41, and we had a bus, I think, till 43. But then we walked from that point on. And uh, it wasn't a bad walk. It generally was six, eight, ten kids walking in the same direction, and we'd walk through Bedford Avenue and down to the church and school. Um, of course, when you walked, you had to cross the railroad tracks. Uh, yes. Was there a gate there, or was there? I there know was, was at the time. There was there was the gates, and we each, and we had a guard, <coughs> and he would come out, and he would lower the gates, and the bells would ring, and the lights would blink, red lights would blink back and forth, so you knew there was a train coming, and. Um, one of the things that you could do, uh, because the tracks were on the ground, is if you were lucky enough to have a penny, you would put the penny on the railroad track. And after the train went over it, you'd go find it, and the penny would be about the size of a quarter. And it was pretty flat. But it was like a kind of a sense of, of pride that you had one of these flat pennies. <laughs> When you when you went to uh, St. Barnabas, what kind of uh, playground equipment did they have for you? Or get lunchtime um, and whatever. <laughs> they didn't have any. Okay. Um, they had a lot, and when I got into like the fourth grade, uh, fifth grade, um, we were playing kind of a game of softball, and they stopped it because they were afraid that the smaller kids from first and second grade would get hurt. We'd run into them and things like that. Oh, this was in the church lot, you mean? Yeah, they had a church playground, basically, is what it was. And what we did then was we had a, a nun who was the fourth grade teacher. And Do you remember she, her name? Sister Regina. And she worked it out there where the library is today was an open lot. And at lunchtime, we would, she would get us all down, and we would play, soft, we would play softball in a lot. Um, it wasn't a long game by any means. It was, you know, 30 minutes, 35 minutes maybe. And then the bell would ring, and we'd have to go back to school. Um, were, there, were there any uh, uh, priests that you particularly remember when you were in grammar um, school? Yes, um, the pastor who started St. Barnabas, Father Powers, was quite old by the time I was in school. But we had a, a young priest, uh, Father Radican, and he was a really young, nice, um, came from a family, I assume, that had reasonable financial funds. He had a big 41-foot boat that he docked down in Belmore in the harbor. And in the summertime, um, he would take four or six of us out fishing. Um, it was a great day. It was a lot of fun. Fishing was a, a normal thing in our growing up years. And because we lived near the water, and it was great. He was also um, really nice. Um, he could relate with young kids, young boys especially. 
And what else? That's, you know, he well, had, you mentioned, he had oh, sorry. Yeah, in the summertime, July and August, he had what was called the Fisherman's Mass. And the Fisherman's Mass was at 6 o'clock. And he guaranteed that it would never be longer than 18 minutes. There was no sermon. And it was... So being a young boy, probably was more young boys going to that Mass than there were fishermen. But it gave us all of Sunday off. <laughs> now, of course, um, <clears throat> I know that you remember the uh, a lot of the storekeepers because uh, mm -hmm. you had told me that the village was the main shopping area. Is there anybody in particular that you remember from, from Belmore Village? Oh. Not, not specifically to take one or two out, but you knew them all, and they knew you. Um, one of the big changes in Belmore was that most of the shop owners, if not all, lived here. They lived in the town someplace, uh, which today I don't think any of the shop owners live in town. Um, you get to know them. Uh, they knew you, and... Uh, it, it was more friendly. Um, I remember you mentioning that uh, um, there was actually like a feed store in Belmore. Yeah, on, Bel on Belmore Avenue, um, uh, almost on the corner of Belmore Avenue and Grand, it was Shiflin's, Shiflin's Feed Store. It was two elderly men. They were brothers. <coughs> they were never married. And... The place looked like um, it looked like a hoarder's house. Um, it was, but they had everything, and you could go <coughs> in and you could ask them for something, and they'd say, "We got that someplace. Come back tomorrow." And generally, they had what you were looking for. Um, they sold all kinds of animal feed and hay, and um, in the spring they would have uh, they would have chicks, baby chickens. People had chicken coops. Um, they had pigeons. People had pigeons in those days. A lot of, I did. Everybody did. Why did you have the pigeons? Was it as a pet? <laughs> yeah, it was. It was. It was. Um, uh, it was something that you did. Everybody did. Uh, How many did you have? Um, at the high point, I had fifty. And where Where did they live? <laughs> in a pigeon coop in the backyard. And it also, it taught you certain things. You had to take care of them. You had to feed them, water them. You had to clean the coop. You had to f let them fly every day. Um, it, it taught you a certain amount of responsibility. Um, I, res I got them originally, was a man that worked with my father in Grumman. Um, he raised racing pigeons. And he had several hundred. And he lived in Sayville which was very rural at that time. And he gave my father 12 pair of homing pigeons. And that was how I started the coop with those pigeons. By homing pigeon, that's the pigeon that comes back? Yes. Yes, that was one of the, one of the, the th um, enjoyable parts of pigeons. You would have a you would have your flock of pigeons and everybody and there was probably forty or more flocks of pigeons within Belmore in the area, and everybody flew them early in the morning, and you flew them before you fed them, and the flocks would get together, and it was a rivalry because sometimes a pigeon would stay with a, uh, somebody else's flock and go home with them. So you'd lose a pigeon, but then maybe you would gain a pigeon from somebody else's. So it was the fun part of it, you know, to see if you could get free pigeons. <laughs> <laughs> and this was mostly young boys, or did, did was it every no, age? No, no, we had some, quite a lot of elderly men. I mean, men in their married families. Um, it was a, a hobby. hobby sport, yeah, yeah. Um, when I finally uh, got older and really didn't want the pigeons anymore, I sold them, 
and probably for two years after that, um, I'd go outside and there'd be two pigeons or four pigeons sitting on the, on the roof of the house. Um, they just had a sense of coming back. Okay, thank you. And um, you talk about the village. Uh, I know right past the village or near the village was the movie house, the old movie house. I'm sure yes. you patronized it like every other kid in Belmark. Do you have any memories of that? Um, yes, yes. It was, it was the only show in town, so to speak, you know. And so on Saturday, it was packed with young people, children my own age, and that. And um, it was, we called it the itch. Um, and I originally for years thought it was because <coughs> the manager had a bulldog that wandered around and climbed up on the chairs and wherever it was. And um, we always said it was the itch because the bulldog left fleas all over the place. But in reality, I found out later on in years is that the, the term itch came from the depression. It was one of the few things that people could do as recreation was go to the movies. It was very cheap. And people would say, I got the itch. And that meant that they wanted to go to the movies. Um, you met a lot of kids there, a lot of children your own age, a little older, a little younger. Um, you made friendships outside of your immediately, immediate area where your house was. Um, there was lots of, we had lots of young people in Belmore. Um, what were the shows like? What, what, what were the movies? Um, they were pretty bad. <laughs> um, you had uh, five cartoons. Then you had a Joe Dokes behind the eight ball short. Or you had um, a short with uh, some other group. Um, then you always had uh, what was called the movie time uh, news. Uh, it was during World War II. And of course, there was no TVs or anything like that. And they had this. It was. It was. It was like we have a news on TV today, but it was in the movies, and it was mostly about what was going on in Europe or in Asia and that type of thing. And then you had two movies. You had a a real bad movie, and then you had uh, what was called the special of the week, which a lot of times was a cowboy movie or it was. Um, um, uh, Robinson murder story or gangster thing, you know. Well, 90% of them were black and white. But you went to the movies, they started at one and you got out at five. So. Um, how about uh, your refreshments? Did they have popcorn machines and soda no, machines? No, they didn't have any of that. They had, um, uh, there was, a, there was a, a card card table in the front and he sold candy. But most of us couldn't afford to pay for the candy at the movie house, so we got candy from different places in town. Um, if you were lucky and you had a few extra cents, um, you could go into the village pharmacy. The village pharmacy had a he had had a uh, peanut, and it was like a round circular disc that went around in a circle and it was covered with peanuts it started at the top with the with the expensive ones like pecans and and um, cashews all the way down to the bottom where it was spanish peanuts and it had a big light on it and and the thing slowly revolved and it kept the peanuts warm and probably kept them dry and you could get a pound of spanish Peanuts for 17 cents. A half. Half pound. Yeah. And uh, that's when you had a lot of money. Or if you were really rich, we had a, we had a uh, candy store um, soda parlor in town called Sensmeyer's. And he owned, a, he owned a candy factory in, Sy in Amityville. And he would have homemade candies... Uh, chocolate-covered candies and stuff like that. But he also made his own ice cream in the cellar. And everybody had a favorite, but probably the one everybody liked the most was, was uh, black raspberry ice cream. And he had real cones, 
He had the real waffle cone. It wasn't that other kind of plasticky thing. Was it expensive? <laughs> yes. Definitely was not cheap. That's why you only went there when you had extra money. <laughs> so where did you get your, your candy for the movie um, if you didn't buy it at the movie house? Generally, we would get it at a candy store. Um, we had a candy store near my house. Um, then we also had in town, we had a candy store. It was called Smitty's. And Smitty's was on the corner from the movie house. And you could buy penny candy there. You could buy nickel candy there. He also had a uh, lunch counter. And at the lunch counter, he had, and it's the only place I ever remember and have never found it since, he had a soda, um, which was called Crushed Cherries. It was Crushed Cherry Smash is what it was called. And for a nickel, you could get a Crushed Cherry Coke smash soda and it was really good but it was a nickel and a nickel when you were eight nine ten years old was a lot of money <laughs> um <clears throat> can you tell me some of the things that you did um as a boy uh i know one time you mentioned to me uh about brownings lake yeah a pond brownings yeah brownies pond. pond was a mad made lake by a man by the name of Browning, and he was elderly. He was in the stock market. Um, he married a very young woman. Um, she, he was in his 50s. She was like 16 or something mm -hmm. like that. And he owned the property there, and there was a lot of springs, freshwater springs all over. And what he did is he created a lake. He had it actually dug out and built, and he put a dam up. And in the middle of it was an island, and he was going to build his new wife a castle on the island. Uh, then a combination, I guess, of the stock market crash, and he died. Um, the land eventually just became part of the state, and it was part of the state watershed. But we could walk there from my house. It was about a 10, 12-minute walk. And we <coughs> spent an enormous amount of time there. I mean, myself and a lot of my friends and other kids that we met there, um, we could swim there in the spring. Uh, we'd just wander around in the woods. Um, we'd fish there. Um, in the winter, twice in the winter, once in November, early December, and once in late January, February, uh, my friend who lived across the street from me, Joe, we, him and I, muskrat hunted down there. And <clears throat> there again, you, you could set your traps, and you had to check them every day. So you got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you went to Brownies, and you checked your traps. And if you had any muskrats, you brought them home, and you reset the traps. Then you cleaned up, and you went to school. And then when you came home from school, you skinned the muskrats. <laughs> and um, we, had, we, had, we had metal frames that we could stretch them on, and then um, you salted them down. And in Wantour on the corner of Park and Wanter Avenue was, it, it's, the shopping center is still there. There was a Sears and Roebuck catalog store. It, there was no, no merchandise. It was just a store with a counter with the catalogs. Mm -hmm. And people went in and they looked up things in the catalog and ordered it. But during the season, for, for pelt season, there was a man came in from Sears and Roebuck every other week and you bring your pelts in, and then he graded them, and they paid you. And it was anywhere from $2 to $5 per pelt. So um, that was one of the things we did. I, that's how I got money to buy Christmas presents. <laughs> how about, um, since Belmore was such a fishing village, how about mm -hmm. uh, fishing like uh, down south Belmore? Yes. Did on the a other lot side of, of Merrick did a, Road. Did a lot of fishing. Um, it was a... Activity that uh, I guess it, it kept you out of trouble and it had a reward if you caught fish. And um, my friend Joe and I, when I was nine, and he, we was only, there was only a week difference in our ages, um, we built a rowboat. We built a little 12 foot rowboat, flat bottomed rowboat, and it actually floated. And we used to bring it down to the bay, uh, bring it down to the canals where we 
would then go out with oars. We would row out to want to obey, which we called the flats, and we'd go fishing, and we'd go clamming, and in the summertime we'd go crabbing. And it was a lot of fun. What was Cherry's last name again? Fe Federer? Fed Fed Joseph Federer. Federer? Yeah. Um, when we, we went to high, we didn't go to high school together. He went to high school, I think he went to Chaminade. And then um, when he graduated, he went into the Air Force. And the last time I talked to him, he was leaving the Air Force and was going to be living in Arizona. His family, of course, had to give up the farm, I'm sure, because there's all houses well, up there now. Yeah, but they, they actually, uh, in 1947, um, the state came in and asked us, asked his parents, um, do you own this land here, which was the, the pasture for the cows? And they said yes, and they gave him a piece of paper that said, you don't own it anymore. Um, they, by eminent domain, they took all the property, and that's how they built Southern State Parkway. Now, that's your friend Joey Federer up North Belmore, the mm -hmm. Joey that you talk about who built, lived across the street from you and built a rowboat that mm -hmm. was Joey... Cortez. Cortez. Mm -hmm. And he now lives now in Homosassa, Florida. Okay. Um, how about how about your jobs? I don't mean chores, and I don't mean selling fish, but I mean, right, right. Uh, how about any jobs that you had to earn money as, as a kid? Well, I had a lot of them. Um, most of them didn't last really long. You know, maybe over a summer or fall, that kind of thing. But... There was enormous opportunities if you were willing to work. Um, my first job was um, there was a strawberry farm on the corner of Belmore Avenue and Jerusalem Avenue, and it was a very big one. And <clears throat> in the spring, the she would hire, hire kids my age, and we would weed a row of strawberries. And it would take four to five hours to weed the whole row, give you an idea how big the property was. And for that, we got paid two dollars, and all the strawberries we could eat that she didn't see. <laughs> <laughs> um, then um, my next, actually, I guess regular job, which I worked on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, on the corner of Newbridge Road and Oak Street, was a small florist, and the man's name was Aaron Hansi Aaron. He came from Germany. Um, Hansi Aaron's family owned a very big florist in Germany and he had been in World War I in the German army and when the war was over he came here and opened up a small florist and I worked there I started working there um, he used to make compost piles for the flowers um, these compost piles were the, as big as a one car garage and he would get, the town would drop off leaves, and he had farmers in Belmore at the time, we had two dairy farms, and they would drop off the manure. And then there was, of course, dirt, and you built layers of this stuff up. And uh, then I graduated into working inside the florist, and uh, his specialty was a flower called cyclamen, or poor man's orchid. And um, he sold a lot of them to other f commercial florists. And you would grow them. And it was a whole series of steps that were involved. Everything had to be sterilized. He had a, he had a room in back of the a greenhouse. And in it was two 55-gallon drums. And they were set up on blocks. And you would put, you would put the, the dirt or the composted dirt in there. And then you start with water and you started a fire underneath it and you boiled the water for so long to sterilize the soil. And then um, he would start to grow these things. And then when they got to be big enough to go into a three-inch pot, um, he would get orders from various florists from Connecticut and New Jersey and places like that. And then he would say, yeah, I would go in on a Saturday morning and he'd say, yeah, I have an order for 2000 And then... I had to take them out of the ceramic pot and wrap it in newspaper and then pack them in boxes. 
and then you sealed the boxes, and then when you got to whatever the number the order was, plus a few extras in case they died, um, then he had a trucker pick them up and bring them to the forest. But it was it was interesting. He was he was really a nice person, um, kind of gruff in in a sense, but uh, very fair. Um, never married. Um, he had a brother and sister. By now, World War II was over. He had a brother and sister in Eastern Germany. And uh, he would, uh, I'd come in, he'd say, can you come in in the morning? That would be Sunday. I'd say, okay, after mass, I'll just come to work. And I'd go, and he would have, like, um, he would buy his brother a suit, okay, with his jacket and pants. And I would sit at the table and with a, with a razor blade, and I would separate the suit take the arms off and separate the suit into th four or five pieces. Then he would send it to his brother in pieces, and he would do the same with the pants. They would cut, you'd actually just one leg and another leg. If he sent the suit over whole, his brother would never get it. It would, it would get to customs and disappear. So he just used to send pieces. <laughs> and uh, he would, like shoes, he would send over one shoe. And then I would have to take, I would have to take, um, uh, aluminum foil, and and uh, at the time um, plastic wrap was new, but it was very very handy to have. Take a pound of coffee, and maybe take like eight ounces of it and wrap it up and put it in the shoe, and then seal the shoe up so that when his brother got it over in Germany, he could take it apart, and then maybe a month later he got the other shoe. So now he had a pound of coffee and two shoes. <laughs> <laughs> but it was interesting. It was a lot of fun. Um, I liked the job. Um, by then I started high school, and I was kind of didn't feel like working weekends anymore, but wound up working weekends anyway. Um, <clears throat> around the corner from me was a luncheonette, Dibb's Luncheonette, and I started working there. And I worked on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, <clears throat> Wound up, I worked there even after high school. I was going to school in Manhattan. And um, it wound up, I basically was managing the place on weekends. And it was uh, it was involved. Um, we made everything from scratch, made all the syrups for the fountain for different flavors, um, made ice cream cakes. Um, I had to, on Saturday and Sunday, I had to pre-plan um, two main meals like maybe on Saturday you would have um, baked ham and spaghetti, and maybe Sunday was two other different things, and you had to get it all ready. And uh, Saturday morning was probably the worst because um, the lighting company, the telephone company, the men that were working overtime all came there for breakfast. So my Saturday started around 4.30 in the morning where I would go in and I found out how to cook bacon, kind of. It was like 75% cooked. And then you had piles of that, and you made made uh, hash brown potatoes from scratch, and you'd have a big pile of them on the grill. And then these, when they came in, it was probably 90% of them was the same breakfast. It was eggs over easy with potatoes and bacon. And you could put the, you could put the eggs on the grill to cook, the potatoes were done already. They were in a pile on the side, and you could put the bacon on a platter, which you put under the grill, which is a grill, which is a, a uh, griddle. And okay, by the time the eggs were done, the bacon was fully cooked. The potatoes went on it, and you had uh, somebody else was making toast and coffee, and that was it. <laughs> uh, can you tell me about when you learned to drive? Um. Well, that was interesting. Again, <laughs> you couldn't do it today. But uh, growing up, there was probably maybe 4,000 people in Bummer. So it didn't really start to en enlarge in size until after World War II was over and it was late 40s, early 50s. But um, everybody or 90% of the people had coal furnaces in their cellar. So that meant you had ash. And there was only so much ash you could put in your driveway. So otherwise the driveway would be higher than the foundation of the house. So my father made a deal with me that when, when I was about 12, I guess, 
he said, if I helped him with the ashes, and then he'd show me how to drive. So at the time, and it's still there, is the, in Merrick, is the town garbage dump. Well, when we first started going there with the ashes, it was a hole in the ground. I mean, <laughs> literally, they, they actually bulldozed a road where you drove down, you dumped your ashes, and then you drove back up. Um, Anyway, he drove there, we emptied the ashes and everything, and then he drove up out of the hole, and then I could drive home from Merrick. <laughs> so, um, today, that hole in the ground is now called Merrick Mountain. <laughs> I think you know where it is. <laughs> how, uh, how, how, um, how old did you have to be to get a, a real license? Uh, you could get a junior license at 16, and at 18, you could get uh, your regular license. Um, my grandfather lived in California in Reseda, and I went out when I was 14. I had graduated from grammar school, and I went out to visit for a summer. While I was there, I took my driver's test in California where you could legally drive at 14, and I got my license, and I came home. And I went to Mineola, and I says I wanted to get my license changed to a New York license. And they said, no, come back in four <laughs> years. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, had a junior, I had a junior license at 14, but that was about no car, so I couldn't drive. But when I was 18, the day I was 18, I went over and took my test and passed and got my first car. <laughs> um. There's one story that I, I remember you telling me about the shopkeepers um, in town, and you had mentioned Smitty's where uh, everybody got the penny candy uh, mm -hmm. for the movie house and the cherry smash sodas. Um, you also told me something else about Smitty's, uh, Miss, uh, yeah, well, you know, Mr. Smith who okay. owned it. Right, right. The, the candy store was directly across the street from the railroad station, and um, he sold newspapers. He'd have seven or eight different kinds, and he had a bench that he had out by the front door. And all the papers were piled up there, and there was a cigar box, and it was strictly on a system. You had all the people that went to work in the city and took the railroad. They would come, and if they wanted a particular paper, it was a dime, they put a dime in, and they took the paper. And if they needed change, they had a quarter, and they'd take 15 cents out of the box. Strictly on a system. And... Uh, Later on, when I was older and I was talking to him, he said he doesn't think he ever lost a dime. Well, that was the way it was then. Um, everybody knew everybody else to a certain point. Uh, my mother once told me she never worried about me because during the day, somebody would call and say, oh, um, Jackie, Jackie just went by the house with so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. so she always basically knew where I was and what I was doing. And uh, that's the way it was. It's, that's how it changed a lot, you know, as the, the town grew and grew. And um, that, was, that was a thing I did when I was a kid. I forgot all about that just now. On Merrick Road was a sports goods store, sporting store, and he sold bait fishing equipment and bait. And in the summer, um, my friend Joey Cortez and I would go out at night and we would catch night crawlers. And he gave us $20 for a thousand night crawlers. But it took us two nights, maybe four and a half hours or so each night to catch a thousand night crawlers. But that was one of the things. Um, today, if you asked the kid to go out night crawl hunting, he'd probably look at you like he went nuts. <laughs> But you did these things, you know. Um, I went crabbing, went clamming, and we had the red wagon. We'd go around the neighborhood and we'd sell them to the neighbors. Um, most people were, um, I guess, large percentage of people were Christian and, and a lot of were Catholic. They didn't eat meat on Friday. So we would always arrange to, to go clamming and crabbing and stuff on Thursday and Thursday night. And then Friday morning we'd go around and hawk all this stuff. Well, thank you, Jack. Uh, a lot of good stories there. Okay. <laughs>